are still in the book of Hebrews. We're almost done. And by now, turn this thing on. By now you should know what the point of the book is. The writer has been writing to encourage his readers to stick with Jesus. They were being uh, facing persecution. They were being threatened. Uh, with exclusion from the synagogues and or the temple, which were the center of Jewish life. And somewhere along this series, as I've emphasized that over and over and over again, you may have thought to yourself, so what do I need to know this for? What's the application to me? There's no parallel to my life. I'm not being excluded from anywhere. There's no I don't go to a temple, I don't go to a synagogue. Uh, nobody's going to keep me from going to the church or something else. However, there is a parallel to our lives today. Christians around the world are being persecuted and threatened. Uh, threatened with persecution in various ways. And not just in Muslim countries or Hindu countries or Buddhist countries, but even in countries that have been historically known as Christian countries. Canada, Great Britain, Australia, and increasingly in America. Uh, I foresee a time that you young adults and teenagers in your lifetime will face persecution for being a Christian. You will be threatened with exclusion from something in some way. For example, you may not be aware of the big news in Australia this week. Anybody kept up with what's going on in Australia? Seven players on one of the National Rugby League teams. Now, this is big. This is like the National Football League or the Baseball Leagues. Seven players on one of the National Rugby League teams have refused to wear the team's new jersey, brand new jerseys, because there are pride ribbons on the jerseys. The seven players, all Christians, have refused to celebrate what the pride ribbons stand for, and they're being persecuted for their stance. The pride community doesn't just want us to tolerate them. They want full acceptance, and full acceptance means that everybody needs to celebrate all that pride stands for. And if you refuse, you may be belittled and criticized and ostracized and excluded. Those seven players will be excluded from the games this weekend that they were scheduled to play. And many are calling for them to be fired, kicked off the team entirely. And you might think, well, that can't happen in America. But we're headed that way. It will happen in America in the future. <coughs> So let me ask you a question this morning. Are you willing to be excluded for Jesus? Are you willing to be excluded for Jesus? That's the context of the book of Hebrews. And it's a context that Christians around the world are facing today in different places. Now, as we have several times in this series, we're gonna start in the Old Testament this morning. Uh, the reason we have started in the Old Testament is because our author is going to reference or allude to something in the Old Testament. And if you don't know what he's writing about, you won't know what he's writing about. He's also going to refer to something to Jesus, and we'll look at that as well. So we're starting with a map of the camp of the Israelites. As they were traveling around for 40 years through the wilderness... Uh, they would stop and camp, and God determined how they would set up the camp. It was always the same. In the center of the camp, you see the tabernacle, and the entrance to the tabernacle was always facing east. No matter where they were, it always faced east. The little boxes, the little yellow boxes there in the picture, are the tribe of Levi. 
The tribe of Levi was divided up by families within the tribe, and they were designated spots on all four sides of the tabernacle. And then the other, the big boxes in the diagram that you're looking at, represented, it's not there. Can you go back one? This one, okay, we're still there. Uh, the big boxes represent the, the, uh, the other tribes of Israel, and each was given a designated place, uh, either on the north side, the east side, the west side, or the south side of the camp. And they always camp in the same place. God made the designations. This is all in the Old Testament. You can, I know you've read this a hundred times. <laughs> so God determined what the camp would look like. And we're going to need to recognize that this is the camp. The tabernacle in the center of the camp. Uh, the entrance was the east, the tribe of Levi's uh, there. In the tabernacle was an altar. Uh, and also on the western end of the tabernacle was the tent of meeting. This was a large tent uh, with two rooms, an outer room and an inner room. And in the outer room was called the holy place, and the inner room was called the most holy place, or sometimes the holy of holies. And in this room was the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark represented God's presence with his people. Uh, God camped with the people in the center of the camp. So he was with his people there in the center. Only the high priest could enter that inner room, and he could only do so on one day a year, on the Day of Atonement. And he had to do so in a prescribed way. <laughs> There were certain procedures he had to go through. These are all spelled out in Leviticus chapter 16, uh, the procedures he had to go through. Uh, but we're only going to consider part of what he had to do that day. On the Day of Atonement, a sin offering was made for the nation. And the sin offering consisted of two goats. Two goats. The first goat was killed there in the courtyard uh, at the altar and some of the blood was taken inside the tent of meeting, uh, and not just to the first room, which they normally did, but into the inner room. And he would take some of the blood and he would wipe it onto uh, the Ark of the Covenant and pour out the rest of the blood there in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Then he would go back out to where that animal was killed, and they would cut open the animal, and they would cut out from the end chest cavity of the animal, all of the fat that was there and the liver and the kidneys. The fat and the liver and the kidneys were burned on the altar. Okay? Uh, and then normally, whatever other part of the animal was going to be sacrificed would also be burned. But in this case, the rest of the animal, the meat, the skin, the bones, everything else was taken outside of the camp and burned up at a certain place outside the camp. So the sin offering for the nation, for the sins of the nation, was taken outside the camp. Then the priest would take the second goat and lay his hands on it, confessing the sins of the nation. And then that goat was taken by a man designated for the purpose out into the wilderness to be loosened there, far outside the camp. This is significant. The two goat off sin offering for the sins of the nation took all of the sins of the nation out of the camp, out of the nation, far from them. Uh, one was burned outside the camp and the other was released into the wilderness. So all of the sins of the nation were, were removed on the animals from the camp. That's the picture we need to see. Um, our Hebrews author is going to reference that. And now something about Jesus. Remember that Jesus, uh, on the day he was arrested, he was arrested that night. He was taken before the high priest. He was found guilty in their eyes of blasphemy. Uh, later taken to the Roman governor who uh, condemned him to death on a cross. He was then beaten, dishonored, and finally taken to be crucified. Where did they take him to crucify him? Outside the city. Outside the camp, if you will. 
They took him outside and crucified him there. So Jesus died outside the city, and the author is going to make reference to that as well. Now we're going to pick up in Hebrews chapter 13, and we're starting in the middle of verse 9. The middle of verse 9. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods, which are of no value to those who eat them. Now you're all familiar with what he's talking about, right? Shake your head if you don't know what he's talking about. All right, the ceremonial foods are those foods from those Old Testament animal sacrifices. Uh, in the one I described, none of that sin offering was eaten. But the regular offerings, even the regular sin offerings not, uh, th that you would bring if you were a Jewish person to the, to the temple or to the tabernacle, uh, part of that was given to the priests. The priests, in most of the sacrifices, were given some of the sacrifice to eat. That was their wages for serving in the temple. And in the case of a fellowship offering, if you brought a fellowship offering, uh, not only would the priest get to eat some of that food, you'd get to eat some of it. So the animal was sacrificed, some of it was burned on the altar, and then you and the priest, your whole family, would go over here and have a picnic in the tabernacle. Or maybe outside of the tabernacle, we don't know. Uh, but when they had the whole temple, you would do that in the temple. You would have this picnic over here, and you would eat some of that animal that had been sacrificed to the Lord, signifying your fellowship with God. But none of those sacrifices, none of those sacrifices that were eaten uh, by the priests there uh, brought complete forgiveness of sin. None of them brought complete forgiveness of sin. Uh, and the author of Hebrews points that out earlier in the book of Hebrews. We've been through that in detail in chapters 8, 9, and 10 of his letter. Instead, by the one sacrifice of Jesus, we have complete forgiveness and we have intimate fellowship with God. We have it better than they did. We have it better than they did, which the next verse alludes to. Verse 10, we have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. And our altar, the one at which we pray each day, is a spiritual altar. At it, we confess our belief in Jesus that his death paid the full sacrifice for all of our sins. And what he's saying is that those Mosaic priests who rejected Jesus and continued to offer and eat the sacrifices in the temple daily have no share in the blessings that you and I have in Jesus Christ. We pick up again in verse 11. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering. That's the day of atonement. But the bodies are burned outside the camp. So that's what we described earlier. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. There's our reference to the Day of Atonement sin offering, burned outside the camp, and the reference to Jesus who, was, who died and was buried outside the city. A place of execution, a place of exclusion outside the camp, outside the city. A place of exclusion, a place of humiliation, a place of dishonor at least in the eyes of the public. Jesus is our sin offering. Jesus is our perfect and lasting sin offering. So the sin offering had to be removed from the camp, removed from the city. Our sins are far removed from us. Jesus became sin for us. So once more, he is... He's pointed to those truths that we've emphasized uh, time and time through this book. And then he gives us some ways to respond to these truths. 
Uh, he's done this throughout the book, especially since the middle of chapter 10. He's given us different responses that we should make to these truths, and we find the last of those today. Uh, and this is the this is the key one. Uh, this first one: choose disgrace and exclusion with Jesus. Choose disgrace and exclusion with Jesus. Look at verse thirteen. Let us then go to him, Jesus, outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For we do not have an enduring city. We're looking for the city. We do not have here an enduring city, but we're looking for the city that is to come. We're looking for the heavenly Jerusalem to come down on the new earth. And we looked at that hope of the Christian life earlier in this book. In Paul's letters, he several times said that he was participating in the sufferings of Christ. We know that Paul had, had horrible experiences. He was beaten, he was robbed, he was uh, hungry, he was naked, he was uh, cold, he was shipwrecked, uh, he was stoned. Uh, all the things that he went through, when, when he described those, he said that he was experiencing the sufferings of Christ or participating or completing the sufferings of Christ. And I believe that what he meant was that anytime you and I face persecution as Christians, we are sharing in the sufferings of Christ. And that's what he's describing here. He said, let's do that. Let, let's, let's be persecuted for Christ. Let's be persecuted for Christ. One of those passages in the book of Acts uh, when the 12 apostles, the 11 at that point, were uh, arrested by the temple guards and dragged before the high priest, the Sanhedrin, and were told uh, not to preach Jesus any longer. And they said, well, you know, God said to do so. It says that they beat them and let them go. They beat them and then let them go. And the apostles left. Anybody remember what it says? rejoicing that they had suffered for the name of Jesus. You ever read that and thought, not me. I don't want to do that. I wouldn't be rejoicing. Amazing, amazing past. Of course, they did that in the power of the Holy Spirit. But that's what our author here is saying to do. Choose to, if that's what comes your way, and re embrace it. Choose it. Be reviled, be persecuted, be excluded with Jesus. And in the world today, there are Christians who are being persecuted for their faith. They're belittled and called bigots and haters and worse and excluded. Uh, in many places, if you're family or of one religion, the Muslim religion or Hindu religion, and you convert to Christianity, you are often excluded by the rest of your family. They no longer have anything to do with you. They don't talk to you. They don't eat with you. Um, you're, you're removed from the family in their eyes. And in some countries, they can legally kill you for converting to Christianity. They don't want the Christian faith spreading in their family and the community. And in places like Australia and Canada and even in our country, Christians are being persecuted for holding biblical values. They're being reviled and excluded. What are you willing to suffer for Jesus? Are you willing to lose your family or your job or your home or your wealth or your nation or even your life for Jesus? Are you willing to give up everything on earth for Jesus, your eternal inheritance inheritance is in heaven, kept there, safe for you, it says in 1 Peter. Are you willing to stick with Jesus, going against the unbiblical values, beliefs, and morals of culture and family and heritage and nation? Are you willing to stick with Jesus, who is our sin offering? He was killed for our sins, killed in our place, killed for our atonement, killed to appease God's wrath, killed to satisfy the insult to God's honor. 
choose disgrace and exclusion with Jesus. And then he has a few more responses to make. Verse 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. So three quick points. Choose to worship daily. Choose to worship daily. Worship, personal worship, from the heart worship, daily worship should come from each of us to Jesus in response to the truths of this letter. Choose to share your joy with others. And your joy of these truths, go out and do good and share of your bounty with others, your material blessings as well as your spiritual blessings in Christ. And then choose to submit to spiritual authority. In your celebrating, uh, the celebrating of your salvation, do not get carried away into pride, but humbly submit to those God has placed over you. Now, in our church, we don't have elders. We don't have deacons who serve as elders. Uh, we don't have a, a human authority over us in the church. But every Christian, every Christian has the Lord Jesus over them, and he communicates through the Holy Spirit. So do not ignore the Spirit speaking to your life, convicting of sin, calling you to repentance, empowering your obedience. Jesus is calling to stay with him, to stick with him in this letter. He's calling us that no matter the cost, we choose disgrace and exclusion with him.